So from 1958, here's a little bit of Rawhide. <laughs> Good evening, it's old Rawhide from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Monday evening. I feel a little inhibited this evening, a little jumpy. This is getting, of course, internal and behind the scenes, but I just learned an hour ago that I'm being assessed this evening. This is a system recently adopted in the CBC Maritime region, anyway, of assessing programs. They pick five or six CBC staff folk. And these chaps sit down, instead of watching Howdy Doody, they have to sit by their radios after their working hours are through, and they assess. It's sort of like Russian roulette. They might let five shows go by, and then they pounce on the, the sixth one. So we're being assessed this evening. They, they make out little forms, you see, and then they hand the forms in, and then I think somebody assesses the forms. I don't quite know what happens to them. But uh, they make little remarks, suggestions for the improvement of programs. For example, tonight somebody will be sitting down in his home, probably little things like, felt Rawhide had too much cleft in his palate, or perhaps feel addition of Halifax Symphony would improve program. The program seems overly long. Feel 15 minutes would be better than quarter of an hour. Just one ruddy moment here, sir. Do you mean we're being spied upon this evening? Well, no, no. It's assessing, Sir Cedric. Oh, assess me foot. Great Scott, there's undertones of there's undertones of Orwell's 1984. Why don't you get out these chaps? I know who they do. I know who they are. You fellows who are sitting at home assessing this program, why don't you get out in the fresh air? Goodness gracious, you work all day in the CPC, pale and warm. You've got a chance to go out and get some color in your cheeks when you sit home and assess programs. Well, now, isn't I'll fix you. I know who you are. Bill Langstroth, I'm going to name you. Granny, Granny wouldn't do that. And, and, and Michael Delaney in program kills. Oh, Granny, please. And I'm just, I'll give you something to assess, chaps. I'm going to spit. Yes. I, how would you like to assess this? <coughs> Put that in your report. <laughs> granny, no. Look, you're just making it more difficult for Let's do the show normally, just as we would any evening. Forget about these five chaps sitting at home writing things down. How do you mean, forget about it? I, I'm, I'm not going on the air. That's all there is to it. If I'm going to be assessed, I'm just going to sit here quietly. I'm not going to have them criticize me. I'm an old lady, and I'm not... I don't like being assessed. Well, Granny, it's not that much to get all worked up. I, I know what you're trying to say, but I may be prudish and old-fashioned, but I don't like people assessing me. It has an off-color ring to it. Oh, Granny. Yeah. And five guys sitting at home there with a pencil. Sharpen up your pencils. I'll give you something to us. I was going to swear. Yeah, I'd like to assess that. I was going to swear right down the network. You sharpen your pencils, boy. And get ready for this. You sneaky bunch. Good. Don't, don't, don't. Look, Marvin, please carry on. We're going to continue our citizens' forum discussion as if nothing had happened. Speak in a clear voice, chaps, tonight. Just enunciate well. This is a citizens' forum discussion we began a week ago, never did finish, about the choice of Pugwash as a site for the forthcoming summit conference. There have been persistent reports that Pugwash will be chosen, and uh, we're going to argue the pros and cons. Uh, are you ready, Marvin? <clears throat> oh, <that's raw> hard. <clears throat> oh, Marvin, don't worry about the voice. <laughs> Just want to be sure. Good evening and welcome to Citizens Forum, Canada's national platform of the air. Uh, before continuing with the second half of our Citizens Forum discussion this evening on the subject, do you agree with the choice of Pogwash uh, as the site of a forthcoming summit conference? Before continuing with the second part of this discussion, I would like to sum up the points made during our last discussion. Isn't that incredible? I'll be back right after the news with Max Ferguson. My name's Peter Downey. Tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock, I, along with uh, thousands of other listeners across the country, am going to lose a very good friend. And I hope you don't mind me saying that, because I've, this is the first time that I've ever spoken to you. But I really consider you a, a, a very good friend. And I wonder if that bothers you a little bit, Max. No, no, it doesn't. Uh, because I get this a lot in the letters, and it's usually kind of apologetically said, and I can... Uh, I sympathize because I know what it would be for me to write letters to people in the entertainment profession. But an awful lot of people say over the years that they've sort of looked upon myself and my characters as friends, so I can certainly uh, understand and appreciate that. How do you feel? Oh, kind of exhausted. <laughs> this has been a frenetic, chaotic week. Yeah. A lot of uh, little assignments to keep carrying around in my head. I write them down, but I usually forget about little 
program deadlines and uh, the, all that apart from the, the packing that has to be done when you wind up about 30 years of souvenirs of the business and jettisoning furniture and getting ready to load up my station wagon. You're getting rid of all your records, or most of your no, records? Did I read that somewhere? Really, all I've, I've saved the front seat for my Airedale dog, and now the rest of the little station wagon is principally winemaking equipment, records, and books. But I still have to weed out quite a few records. And it's like saying goodbye to old friends. And You know, another old friend is Buffy. I was sort of hoping that, that you'd bring the air <laughs> <laughs> no, Buff, even under normal conditions, is a bit of a handful around the CBC, but in this kind of a week where I'm flitting around from studio to studio, and he would just uh, add to the confusion, I'm afraid. I remember one of your stories. When I was doing the, the afternoon program in, in Fredericton, I had the pleasure of being able to listen to you and Alan from 3.30 to 4 o'clock just before my show started. <laughs> the story one afternoon about Buffy eating, I think it was your socks, and about 800 oh. pairs of underwear. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> the worst he did in one day, he ate two pairs, and this is, I don't mean just tearing them up, straight down into the intestines, two pairs of underwear, and my daughter's leotards. There's a terribly vulgar aftermath to all that, which I can't tell. It's a funny, funny story, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell it on air. <coughs> the, uh, the follow-up to that later in the day. <laughs> I remember you. Every, every buff story ends up on a, a note of vulgarity, so I can only go so far into them. He's a funny dog. What about, let's go back to, you started in, in the CBC in Halifax in 1946. That's right. Did you really have a can of, of stew that oh, you yes. used to yeah. warm up? Yes, in those days I just arrived, my early 20s, and my chum was the technician who was on master control. We both asked for the night shift because in the daytime we're up on the northwest arm, that lovely strip of ocean that comes right through Halifax, and we had a little sailboat, and we had a canoe, and we just had, it was just like a summer holiday. And then we'd come in at night and put in our shifts for the CBC and earn our money. And we were sa saving the two of us for a bigger sailboat. And we went on this austerity campaign. We'd buy a cabbage for our vitamin C, and he would pull off one leaf. You know the way the cabbage leaves go overlapping? He'd take one leaf, and munch it, and I'd take the other, and we'd do that all night. And for our protein, We'd buy tins of stew. And I used to take them down to a little hot plate in the newsroom and put them on the hot plate around 6 o'clock when I arrived for my shift. And then we'd eat around 8 o'clock. Well, for some reason, we weren't hungry that particular evening. And we're sitting around. Just Our shift was just ending. It was about 11.30 at night. And I suddenly jumped up in master control. The hot plate, I went racing down. I just got to the newsroom wall. And a terrifying explosion, just like a cannon going off. And I reeled back, and bits of stew were slithering obscenely down the walls. It was a mess. I'd stay till about 2 in the morning with newsroom paper, that yellow paper they write on, mopping it up off the walls, trying to put it in reasonably decent shape before the staff came in the next morning. Didn't you use to, to open the door just to, to check on it occasionally, and it would cut off the transmitter, and all the technicians no, were... No, 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 that's, that's, that's another story that's getting mixed up with this one. We finally... We were saving, and our little savings for the sailboat were coming along nicely. And now and again, we would have to cut out from this austerity campaign and treat ourselves to a, a little change of diet. Because to this day, I haven't eaten Irish stew since. Couldn't stand looking at it. So every now and again, we would order fish and chips from a little greasy spoon in Halifax, and they would arrive around 6. And if we weren't hungry and didn't want to eat till 7 or 8 in the evening, we would open the door of the CBH transmitter. All programs out of Halifax went by landline up to our big 50,000-watt transmitter, which used to be at Sackville and is now at Moncton, and at the same time went over our little 100 watts of devastating power. And that little transmitter was in master control. And I, to this day, know nothing about the technical end of radio, but they had told me that if you open that transmitter door as a safety precaution, because there's a lot of voltage in there, everything goes cold, and the station goes off the air. And we used to open that door and try to do it as quickly as possible, get the fish and chips in on the hot tubes and filaments and then slammed the door, but there was a two-second cut, sometimes three or four if we're clumsy about it. And, as you know, the engineer master control at every CBC center has to log everything that happens on the broadcast day, what time this started, when the station calls come in, and they're all sent into Ottawa or someplace, probably keep about 18 guys busy down there reading these things all day. So, our regional director, Captain Ted Briggs, who unfortunately passed away just within a year or so, but he used to get these things on his desk at the end of the week, and, go and I can still see him coming down. What's this about a two-second cut in program feed to Halifax? And none of the engineers knew, because just the two of us had this secret. And it was years after I was out of CBC Halifax. I was living in Toronto. Family of three or four of the youngsters had arrived. 
went back to Hubbard's down the south shore of Nova Scotia, where the CBC had a big community camp. We used to have some lovely parties there. And we're sitting around the campfire, marshmallows, wieners, all CBC staff singing songs. And Ted Briggs, who was still regional director, looked at me and said, now that all the water's gone under the bridge, Ferguson, could you possibly, I think you know, but do you know anything about the reason for those little annoying breaks in the transmission? I said, well, a lot of years have passed, as you say, Captain Briggs, but uh, I can tell you. I told him the story, and even at that late day, he was furious. He tried to tell you, color came into his face. And it had been 10 years since it was happening. But it was us putting the efficient chips into the transmitter to keep them warm. <laughs> Didn't you ever get into a lot of trouble doing things like that? No, no. The they never... Crafty. I don't think I was ever caught out. How did you get interested in radio in the first place, Max? Well, I was heading for a teaching career, and in my dark moments in the CBC and days of despondency, I still hang my head and say, why didn't I go into teaching? Because I still think I would have enjoyed teaching. Mm. But in my final year, I was in majoring in English and French at the University of Western Ontario. For better or for worse, they were given what I think was called the University Sunday Evening Hour on the local station, CFPL. And those who were interested could go down. If you had a little script you wanted to write, or if you wanted to do some acting in the scripts, uh, you could take part. And I got just enough of the bug, I guess, then. Still not completely won over to radio, because I still wanted to really turn on the heat academically and get a fellowship. But before my final exams came up, in about early May or late April, I said, I'll get this out of my system one way or the other. And I wrote the CBC in Toronto, said I'd like to take an audition as an announcer. So they gave me an appointment. I came down by train to the big city. Went in and had the audition, and they were reasonably optimistic about it. They seemed to like it, but they said, uh, get some experience with the private station. And on the strength of that, I let up on my final exams for the first time in my life. I did kind of badly on the exams, and I thought, this is a trap because I'll never hear from them again. I did get a job with CFPL in London just for the summer, yeah. and that fall, lo and behold, the CBC came through with a letter saying there was an opening on the announced staff in Halifax. So I landed there on December the 6th, 1946. You that's really did hear from them again? Yes, I did. There are so Surprised. many people that never hear. That's true. That's true. Hear. It amazed me even back in those days. <laughs> Let's listen to... to we've, we've chosen some of the, the our favorite skits that, that you've done over the years. And one of them... Do you remember this? December 4th, 1965? Do you have any idea what happened on that? Oh, I wouldn't remember what happened yesterday on the program. <laughs> this was in Ottawa. They, they've just... This was the headline. They've just developed a... Or this was the story that you did, developing a new dye to prevent... Canada's new flag from turning orange. I have no recollection of that. In the sun. And Prime Minister Pearson learned of, of the development while vacationing in the Caribbean. And here's how Max imagined Prime Minister Pearson reacting to that news. All right, Miss Thompson, get EMO uh, immediately. Mr. Pearson, I'm terribly sorry, but will you shut up? You've done enough damage. Uh, yes, Miss Thompson, get EMO. Tell them to, t tell them to, to ignore my previous directive. Uh, this is not, repeat, not a, a national emergency. Mr. Pearson, how can I apologize? I, I had no idea my telegram was going to cause all this trouble. Oh, will you shut up? I'll deal with you in, in a moment. Uh, and Miss Thompson, also, get CBC, Radio Canada, and uh, tell them if they can put out an apology announcement. Uh, uh, yes, that's right. That, that uh, emergency address to the nation I gave uh, half an hour ago uh, has to be cancelled completely or denied. Yes, Miss Thompson. And, and, and one other thing, could you could you book me a flight back to Jamaica, the very first possible flight you can get me back? Yes, I would like to resume my holiday. And oh, one final thing, I, I'll need a suit, Miss Thompson. Yes, yes. If they get a suit up to my office here uh, as soon as possible, I'm in my bathing suit. That's the way I came back. Thank you, Miss Thompson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Pearson. I uh, I'm terribly sorry. I didn't know it was going to end this way. Really, I, I I don't know what possessed you to... I thought you'd be so pleased to hear the news that we've solved the problem of the, the new Canadian flag. I, I'm, I would normally be delighted to hear this news if it had been sent to me in a properly worded telegram. But it, why on earth would you send a telegram like that to me down there on the beach in Jamaica? Well, I, the CPR telegraph girl said that if I kept the wording down, I could send it for a dollar fifty. And, you see, I... Inasmuch as we were using the taxpayers' money, all taxpayers' money at a time like that, how would you like to be Prime Minister of this country enjoying a hard-earned holiday on a beach in Jamaica, and with the international situation as it is, somebody runs up to you and hands you a telegram that says, 
all here prepared to die expect red flag over Parliament Hill tomorrow. That was a skit from uh, by Max Ferguson, December 4th, 1965. What would Pierre Trudeau right now say? If, if Pierre was sitting here and I said, Prime Minister, what do you think of Max Ferguson leaving the CBC? Well, I should probably think it's high time. I would have hoped that it might have happened um, the day he joined the CBC, but um, it was well worth waiting for. Did you, ever, did you ever listen to his program? Personally, I never did, although apparently my aides did tell Ferguson on one occasion that uh, they had caught me listening, so uh, I don't know what to believe myself or my <laughs> aides. <laughs> that is incredible. How did you come up... How do you study a voice like that? That is voice... It? appall me when I first heard it, because I think, like, Duncan McPherson, who was a visual cartoonist, I looking, I'm looking for distinguishing characteristics in voices. We had just finished that incredible era where we had Mr. Pearson's voice and Mr. Diefenbaker as the two protagonists in Canadian political life, and they sort of were fading into the background, and on came this new unknown, and I listened to him, uh, and I thought to myself, it's just, it's the boy next door, just a run-of-the-mill voice, and I couldn't have been more wrong. I, I it couldn't get it at all. I, I, I blanch when I hear some of my early attempts to get Trudeau. And then I listened more carefully, and I found a lot of Irish in the meticulous way he enunciates. Uh, the, uh, a lot of nasal. Yeah. Hardly any head tones at all. That's all you put up to the... And uh, every two or three words, that uh, blase, the visual is that Gallic shrug, but if you're listening to it, the audio is... Um, it could be right in the middle of... Sentence, it doesn't matter. Whenever he feels like sighing, he sighs. <laughs> How about Bob Stanfield? Oh, that's a difficult one to do. I always felt kind of squeamish about doing him because I have to make him sound like an idiot. And I, I can't say that I know him well, but I've met him outside of political life in the Halifax days. And whenever I do his voice publicly speaking to groups, I mm. always preface it by saying that I'm sorry that I have to seize on this facet of his speech, which is hesitancy, yeah. because it does make him sound like an idiot, and the man is every bit as well endowed mentally as our prime minister and as the press were just beginning to find out when it was too late, a better sense of humor. Yeah. Does he ever say anything to you about your impersonation? Mm, no. Yeah. It, we've, we've chatted. He doesn't even allude to it, uh, but he's always in a good humor, and uh, I, I'm sure he's, he's a good enough sport that he would never take umbrage. Yeah. Uh, John Diefenbaker whom I was a little worried about when I first started putting him into ridiculous situations. I had him on the floor of the house one groundhog day going on his hands and knees and Mr. Pearson yelling to the speaker, what, Mr. Speaker, what is going on here? And John Diefenbaker looked up and explained that uh, he was looking uh, to ascertain if on this occasion uh, my shadow was visible. If I see it, I'll stay on for another five years, this kind of thing. And invariably, I get a letter from him saying how much he enjoyed the show and being part of it. And he was very good sport. They were all good sports about it. He did call you once. Yes, he did. Didn't he? That was, that was just brink brinksmanship, because I thought it was somebody. I had a darn good impersonator. For a moment, I thought maybe they got rich little or something. Oh, no. And I almost came in the middle of that opening line to say something facetious. And something made me wait. And, of course, it turned out to be John Deacon Baker <laughs> on the phone. Can you tell me about the... Uh, I've read, and now here's Max. I can't even remember how many times. But there was one story about... Uh, I think it was when you were doing the television show Gazette mm -hmm. in Halifax, and you had a monkey. Oh, and, yeah. a, and Was there a horse on, on... There was a horse, but that's an, an off off-air story. That's kind of a racy one. It was in the book. Oh, yeah. Put it in the book. Yeah. But, uh... <laughs> no, it, was, it was quite a, it was a disaster story. But the monkey one, I can tell you. Uh, I was interviewing some crew members from a British submarine that just crossed the Atlantic underwater all the way. And they came in with this little spider monkey. And it sat on my shoulder during most of the interview. And I remember asking them, what's the monkey's name? And one of the chaps says, we'd rather not say, sir. And I said... What's wrong with them having a monkey's name divulged? Well, I, I don't think it'd be quite proper. So we gave that up, and it went on, and the monkey grabbed my finger, my index finger, and I, could, I thought it was going to be sick, just pressing on the bone, and I said, uh, they said, oh, don't touch him now, because he might get angry. Apparently he was in a good mood when he was doing this. Finally, I grabbed him, and he took off all over the studio, up the mic booms, over the cameras and everything. When it was all over, I said to them, I said, why didn't you want to give the name of that little wretch? And he said, well, I, I didn't think it'd be quite proper because we calls him Clement Attlee. That was the monkey's oh, no. name, Clement Attlee. <laughs> and he had a hold of your finger. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I was bitten by a good many animals. The worst one was a baby leopard, uh, ocelot. Oh, really? They were used for hunting in, uh, in Venezuela. 
and this lady brought him in. She brought a kangaroo, but we kept him out of the studio because he knocked out one of our men completely, hit him, jumped with the hind feet, and just winded him. So he was kept out. So she brought the ocelot in, and I said, will we have any trouble from this little creature during the interview? Oh, no, she said, I brought a big knuckle bone, and this thing was snarling and spitting, just like a baby leopard. And the interview went swimmingly up to a certain point where my foot must have come near him, and he'd finished with the, getting the meat off the bone anyway. So he just sat, and I had beige socks on, I remember. The camera's dollied in, and you can see the blood coming through the sock, and this thing, rah, 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 and I reached down. It was excruciating. I had my ankle bone. And again, she said, don't, don't, don't touch him. I said, why? Because you might make him angry. So I had to wait till he went through this good-humored period, chewing on my leg, and finally I couldn't take it any longer. I grabbed the jaws, the top and the bottom, pulled them apart, and just shot him across the studio, and spitting and scum. This was on... on, on oh, all on the whole show. Oh, yeah. They, oh, they loved that. They dollied in for any blood on that, and there was lots of blood on that show. <laughs> I was put out. The most obscene show I ever did was this huge Japanese wrestler. Professor Kato was coming to wrestle professionally in Halifax. And his manager was a punch-drunk little thing with the cauliflower ears. <laughs> and I said, now, we have a rehearsal of the show. Oh, we don't need no rehearsal with him. He's been all over the States, you know. He, he knows how to talk. I said, okay, great, no rehearsal. Got on, the guy dried up after five minutes. And I had a 15-minute interview. And I was desperately, and then he started giving me monosyllabic answers, yes, no. So I was sit searching, and finally said, do you have any favorite holes? And he said, yeah, the sleeper holes. I said, what's that? Well, I can demonstrate. So I look out, and all these big Cape Breton stage hands, every one of them backed away. No, no way. <laughs> How about you? And I said, okay, fine. Put a judo jacket on me, and I stood up smiling in front of the camera. And it was at the supper hour, all of the Maritimes. And suddenly, from behind me, he put a full Nelson on. And my last conscious thought was, this is a madman, and I've walked into his trap. <laughs> now, the next thing I knew, I, was, I knew I was lying on a floor. I thought it was at least a week later. The studio was pitch black. Oh, no. and suddenly, I saw the red light of a camera through the blackness, and then lights came on. This is my end of it in the studio. I got up, and I found I was coughing a little bit, finished the show, and out came the producer, Bill Langstroth. And I've never heard, even in the Maritime, such salty language. The gist of it was, get out of this studio, get out of this city, or we'll have the authorities. Then I found out that apparently I had resisted, which you're not supposed to do going to the sleeper hole. They, he puts his knuckles into the big vein on your neck and cuts off the supply of blood to your brain. But I went down on the floor and then went into a a paroxysm, a convulsion, and it was the moment of my eyeballs, they tell me, were rolled back. In the control room, they took the, cut the cameras, put up a slide, and played Handel's Largo. And the switchboard was jammed, because everybody thought I was dying. I was just thrashing and twitching around oh, the studio. I, I didn't know that until the show was over. I thought he was being very mean to this wrestler. <laughs> I think of one more story for you. The one about Santa Claus. You had a Christmas party? That is. I've told it so many times, I hope I'm not going to bore people with it again, but if I had to pick out the funniest Laurel and Hardy scene... It was, I think, the day before Christmas, probably a Friday. We came down for the rehearsal, as we always did, and I met my guests then. The producer, Cammie Graham, said, no guests today. There's no rehearsal. Go home and have your dinner. Come down for the show. It's going to be a sort of a Dylan Thomas reflection of your childhood Christmas. You, the weatherman, Rube Hornstein, the announcer, Don Tremaine. We're going to have a little fire in the fireplace. And that's all he told us. So I went back home, had my dinner, came down for the show. I think it was on at 7.30 in those days. And there was my bulldog out in the front lawn, shivering up to his ears in snow. And I put him in the car. Well, Cammy Graham was a little uh, upset about having an animal. I said, Cammy, he'll sleep under the Chesterfield. Once a bulldog is asleep, nothing wakes him up. And he was great. Not a sound. He's out of sight. We did the whole show, very nice reminiscences of boyhood Christmases. And at the very closing minute, now they hadn't warned me about this, Bill Fulton, Halifax actor, came in as Santa. Whoa, ho, ho. The bulldog can't stand uniforms. I had a policeman draw his sidearm in Halifax once because he was going, out, going to go out the window after him. So when the bulldog heard this, I heard a bit of scraping, and he came out like a turtle. He couldn't get traction on the <laughs> studio floor, and he came out on all spread eagle. Then he got traction. He rose to his full height, leaped. Now, this is the way the show ended. Bill Fulton had the plum pudding burning. I don't know where they got the overproof <laughs> liquor, but it was burning. The bulldog jumped and was literally hanging because they have a locking mechanism in their jaw from the left or the right buttock. Bill, screaming in agony, threw the plum pudding into the Christmas tree, and it caught on fire. And the 30 closing seconds were the three of us waving, have a nice Christmas, have a merry Christmas. <laughs> and this screams of pain, the bulldog just that strangulated growling, and the whole Christmas tree going up in flames. Can anything Crazy. surprise you anymore? Not after that, no, yeah. no. I guess you just would have had every experience in 30 years. I think so, I think so, yeah. yeah. You're going down on Sunday to, to Neal's Harbor. That's, that's right. That's yeah. where your, your home is. Yeah. What's the attraction down there? If I had to put it in one word, I'd have to say the ocean. There's something, I, I, I think it's even prenatal in me. I was born fairly close to the sea. 
and it's the therapy of, well, not just swimming in it and enjoy it, but just even lying near it and hearing that surf. It's the most soothing sound in the world. The whole pace of life slows down. The values, the sense of values down there, totally different from the city. The silence. Nobody in a city knows what silence is. You think on an early morning here in Toronto that it's silent, but if you listen, there are always noises, a faraway break squeal. I jump a foot when I come back here and hear the first squeal of tires because in the early mornings down there, with the exception of maybe a bird call, there's not a sound, and it's very conducive to peace of mind. Do you get lonely at all? No, I've... Uh, the longest I spent would be last summer, where I spent three months, July, August, most of September. And occasionally, the, I remember a fisherman, one of the fishermen coming up, knocking on my door. The missus sent him up to check on me. Was I lonely? I wasn't. I had a whole day of physical labor, shingling my roof, chopping trees, digging my garden, swimming for three hours in the afternoon, back, working physically. And then at night, that b wonderful, bone-weary feeling. Yeah. A fire going because the evenings are cool down there. And a good book. And a glass of rum. I'm just wondering, I mean, after 30 years of such a frantic pace, what are you going to be doing Monday afternoon? Monday afternoon? What am I going to be doing Monday? I'll get in, I think, in the evening of Sun. Oh, I'll get in the evening of Sunday, of Monday evening. Yeah. Oh, you it'll take two days to get there. Yeah. If there's any light at all, I'll just jump out of the car, as I do every summer, even if it's dusk, and I start mowing the meadow to find where my garden was from the previous year, because the weeds are about waist high. Then I'll start digging that garden. That's the essential thing to get my seeds in, because that's got to feed me next winter. I'm going to live on all my own turnips, cabbages, carrots, and all the vegetables with a freezer full of Atlantic queen crab, which has now become superior in my palate even to lobster. And that'll get me through the winter. Well, I wish you all the luck when you get when you get down there. Let's listen to one more skit from Max, and then uh, Alan will be joining us. This is from uh, December 2nd, 1972. While visiting uh, the British Prime Minister, Pierre Trudeau enjoys a, a private audience and luncheon with the Queen, and here's Max's version of that meeting. Certainly is a delightful treat to uh, enjoy piping hot, strong British tea again. I think that will be ample. Uh... <laughs> Funny how it always smarts when it uh, overflows the cup and swashes onto one's wrist. <laughs> That's uh, That will suffice nicely, thank you. Oh, it's delightful also to see good, strong, rich uh, Devon cream in one's tea. It's uh, something that we don't enjoy in Canada. Is it uh, delivered daily to the palace? <clears throat> I um, had a very good uh, chat with uh, Mr. Heath at uh, his home over the weekend out in the country. Uh, he was asking me how I how I like checkers, and uh, I told him it was delightful, but I think I prefer chess. <laughs> I was making a play on the <clears throat> on the word. Uh, <clears throat> he, um, I was very sorry to read about His Royal Highness, uh, the little accident there during the polo game last week when he rode his uh, pony into the goalpost. Uh, I suppose you'd call that a, a Philip Buster. <laughs> <clears throat> there again, I was making a play on that. Anyway. <clears throat> well, um, this breast of pheasant is one of the most delectable meals I think I've ever eaten. Uh, uh, that would have been shot, I presume, on the grounds of either Balmoral or, uh, or Sandringham. <clears throat> uh, Anne is certainly a, a high-spirited uh, young lady, isn't she? I, I almost got run down just coming into the palace there by the Daimler. Uh, does, she, does she always drive that, uh, that fast? Um <clears throat> I, I love uh, Welsh corgis. They're a beautiful little dog, aren't they? They're so nicely behaved, so gentle. Uh, you wouldn't even realize he was lying here under the table, would you? <laughs> Until one moves one's feet. Um, oh, my goodness uh, gracious, I wasn't even watching the time. It's almost two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I've taken up almost three hours of your time, which is unforgivable. I, uh, I really should be uh, uh, pushing off. I have to see Mr. Heath again, and... Uh, <clears throat> uh, can, can I help you with the dish? <clears throat> well, I, once again, thank you ever so much. I really appreciated the uh, lovely tea and the breast of pheasant. <sighs> that has got to be... That has got to be the longest three hours of my life. Mr. Prime Minister! Yes? How did it go in there? How did it go? How'd you make out? Well, let me tell you one thing. If any of my advisors back in Ottawa ever again dare to suggest taking the royal out of royal canadian mounted police i will personally see that their heads are mounted on the gate posts 
of 24 Sussex Drive. You, you swine, you got your copy out of the library here, Charlie. You didn't give me a royalty on it. Well, I wrote the foreword on it. So you did. <laughs> yeah. I'd forgotten that. Yeah, the epilogue was fine, but the foreword was considered to be better style. <laughs> However. Alan, when you came in, I expected the yeah. windows to shake and the walls to fall down. There are so many stories about you. Can I just ask you about some of them that I've heard and to get your version? Yeah, you understand in, in advance that there'll, oh, there'll be disclaimers late in every one of them at his home. I'll deny everything, but, uh, but well, go ahead, Peter. Well, Max is here. Maybe he can shed some light on something. There was once a time when if an announcer introduced your own program, that was a sign that you had arrived. Did you used to impersonate an announcer introducing a program that you did? Did you do the voice of someone else saying, and now here's Alan McPhee? I don't recall that. Oh, you, you do. Ralph. <laughs> oh, what is yeah. that? Ralph. That is Ralph. Yes, Ralph was <laughs> like that. He was trying to get in, so I'd bring him in the studio because I didn't have an opening provided for my program. What did he say? And now, here's Eclectic Circus with Alec McKee. <laughs> oh, no, Ralph, no. <laughs> Alan McPhee. And now, here's Electric... Uh, oh, and then Ralph would leave. <laughs> no, no, I used to tell him he could stand easy. Well, you stand easy. Smoke if you wish, yeah. but pay attention because I may be asking questions afterwards, Ralph. Was <laughs> <laughs> something like that, yeah. What about the time that you were uh, introducing Terry and the Pirates? He'll deny that Who one. Who has He'll told deny. you that story? They're all over the place. They're in my book that you read. <laughs> I didn't read your book. What gave you the idea? Oh, he read, uh, he read the intro. <laughs> yeah, that, that was terribly embarrassing because that was being fed through from NBC. And we had control of the network. And the way it opened up, it opened up with a Chinese bazaar and all sorts of Chinese sounds in the background, tinkling gongs and all that sort of thing. <laughs> so as you know, when you turn on a microphone as we are now, nothing can be heard from the speaker. So every day I'd simply come in and say, <laughs> How can I put this? You, you watch it. Be careful about this one. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's somebody <laughs> sitting in the booth, so I just use their name and say, do such and such to so and so, or only in a Chinese voice. Frank Willis, he's that sort of thing. And then one day, facilities broke down from NBC, and there was nothing in the background which I didn't know about. We were feeding the whole network, so how I lasted, I don't know. Just sheer talent. He I used guess. to take the names of prominent CBC executives, thinking he was being camouflaged by this Chinese street scene with rickshaws and guns, and he said awfully, naming the executives. Oh, stupid, <laughs> Mr. X. Ooh, him yeah. stupid, him, uh, yeah, him get Max. too much money for sitting on behind all day doing nothing. <laughs> and this was going out with no background. Yeah, Four-letter words. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, really? But you didn't get fired. Happened. How did you no. escape? I don't think any, any of the executive, executives listened. I, think I used to think it was broad-mindedness, but I, I'm coming no. to the conclusion that they just never did listen. No, I don't. He think was fired that. once from the CBC. Though. You were fired? Yeah. I was suspended, yeah. Well, suspended. Yeah. <clears throat> What, what caused two weeks. It's safe time, to ask what caused that. I, I forget what caused that. I really do. You missed an entire new... Well, you've been well, already nothing. in the middle of the Ma Perkins show all that week, blowing your nose, clearing your throat. <laughs> well... You yes. waited till Ma would say something to oh, Shuffle, yeah. and before she got in here, Shuffle, child, I've been wanting to say this for years to you. Watch <laughs> that, Ma, and then this awful sound would come up. So you've been doing that all week and culminated the week by missing the one o'clock news. That's why you're fired. Because right. I remember you asking me, I've got to go in and see Keith Morrow. What do you know about him? He's a maritime guy. Yeah. yeah. But he was then top in the region here, and I said, he, he looks as if he's uh, kind of easy going, but I said, don't try to fool him and put your cards on the table. And, and you've liked Keith ever since because he's I suspended have. you. I was suspended, and I had some work to do in another city, so I just took off on a holiday. Oh, and a paid holiday. A paid holiday. And uh, <laughs> this uh, formal thing, this thing when you're suspended, crossed Keith's desk, and he said, what on earth is Alan McPhee suspended for? And the supervisor said, well, because of such and such and such and such. And he said, oh, for God's sake, get him back and stop this nonsense. So this person phoned this city, got in touch with me and said, please come back. And I said, not a chance. Two weeks off. It was beautiful. <coughs> All is forgiven. Please come back. Yeah. Do you remember when, when you two gentlemen first met each other? Oh, yes. Do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, I remember plainly. Actually, before I had met uh, Max Ferguson, Ted Briggs, who was then the day-to-day uh, -day manager... Regional president. Director. Regional director. No, no. You see, well, see, there's a difference right there. When Max was yeah, talking about him, he said Captain Briggs. That's right. <coughs> well, he knew him and worked as a fellow announcer with him. Yeah, he's dead, by the way. Yes. Yes. Uh, God rest his soul. Anyways, uh, oh, yeah, I guess he was just a regional man. Of course he was, yes, in charge of the Maritimes. Regional director for the yeah. Maritimes. And right. he came up to my house, and we were drinking scotch and so on. And he said, you know, Alan, there's a young man down there. 
which I wasn't paying much attention. I never followed Ted because he always made a, a short story so long. But anyway, uh, he said, uh, there's a young man in the Maritimes who is bright and clever. Well, immediately I sat up at that because I don't like that sort of thing. He said he, uh, he plays country music, which I don't enjoy either. And uh, so I started, uh, I said, oh, yes. And he said, would you like to know his name? And I said, no. He said, it's Max Ferguson. So I disliked Max right off the bat. Then he said, Alan, there's an older chap. When he comes down here, I'd like you to keep your eye on him and show him the ropes. Well, Max came, and I met Max, and I saw the green eyes looking at me reflectively. Yeah, the tired green eyes. And uh, I realized he need no, needed no help at all. So anyway, it's, it's all in the foreword of the book. I won't go on from there, because I'd be rather embarrassed. <laughs> Max, what did you think of Alan when... Oh, well, I heard about him. Yeah. He's been a legend in his time in the CBC uh, as an obstreperous, recalcitrant, non-CBC man. Breaks things physically. When he's in a, throws axes, turns on fire hoses at night. I'm going to leave. Do you, may I get out? <coughs> is the door barred? If the door Do you want a down, story? <laughs> it's not no, too I bad. Want a there are a lot of stories that can never be told, but this is one that wasn't in my book about no, him. No, the story is not true. The reason I thought about it is no. because no. from this studio where we're sitting at this moment, 30 feet across the hallway in Studio G, the control room comes out into the studio. Oh, so there's yeah. a roof. I'd if deny. you were to go there now, Peter, there's no. enough equipment to make it, set up a radio station because after every show we throw up a microphone, pieces of uh, electronic equipment, and they're all still lying there gathered. Yeah, so you, could open you, a did darn the same, good you did the same thing when we used to work in Studio G. You were always flinging things up there. Remember the day I came in with a chicken freshly cleaned and so on that I was going to take home? It ended up there. You flung it up. <laughs> they were looking for that smell. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was <laughs> terrible. Checked. About a year later. Yeah, Plumbers somebody in. Died I couldn't there. understand it. Well, Max asked the question before. How did you escape? Escape? <clears throat> well, how come you never got in any real trouble or got fired? I don't know, do you? Well, you always brought a note from home. <laughs> no, I don't think that was the answer. I don't know. I I'll guess tell you. It's you're so darn good. No, you won't say this. They were terrified of Alan McPhee because I saw this. He did something one day which was so outrageous that even management couldn't ignore it. And upstairs on the third floor, our boss said, we'll put a stop to that. His secretary, God lover, picked up the phone and said, Mr. X is coming down and you're for it. So he starts his pantomime, opened the door so that he could be heard down the hallway because the guy had to come down the hallway to discipline him. And I was standing, I could see Alan from my position also. I could look down the hallway and I saw the guy coming and he was really fierce looking. And inside the studio, the little studio, was Alan pacing up and down this huge stentorian voice. Just wait till he gets here. Let him open his, after all I've done for the CBC, all he's got to do, open his mouth. I'll pitch him out. On, and I saw this man come, the footsteps slowed down gradually. The determination evaporated. He turned halfway down the hallway and went back to his office. The stentorian voice worked. Actually, if he had arrived and said, now look here, McPhee, I would have started to cry. Yeah. <laughs> it would have broken right down. The, the facade would have just cracked right over. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> You're right. It is true, yeah. You've worked together for 19 years, at least. Um, 19, 13. Yeah. Well, we've known each other. I thought it was around a century. quarter so of a century. Seemed like 100 years. Yeah. Yeah. 25 years, I think. But actually, I think the working arrangement was just since 19... Uh, 13 years, isn't it? About that, yeah. 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 Off and on. Yeah. I hear, Alan, I hear that you're uncrackable when he's on the air, when you're on the air. Oh, but you no. cannot be cracked up. Oh, Max, no, that, they used to no, say that. No, yeah. no, there was no, only no. one. Oh. To this day, he's known among Just the announcers as the great stone face. You said that to any CBC announcer, they know immediately it's Earl Cameron because mm -hmm. they couldn't break Earl up. Mm -hmm. And I had heard it about Alan McPhee, but I have seen him oh. lose complete control. Oh, totally yeah. unprofessional behavior. Him. Every morning I break up. <laughs> Not Every as much as I do. Oh, I... <laughs> For he years. breaks me up more I've than that. Just be, he has to concentrate. See, uh, he has to initiate everything. I can just sit there and sort of go along. I used to be able to. Now it's almost all over. <laughs> but anyway, um, due to the fact that he initiates, he, he has to be thinking and so on. So he's, he's eliminated me from his mind. He's thinking of his, uh, what he's going to say next. So just before we go on, being so experienced in timing for so many years, uh, I'll tell him just a terribly obscene story. <laughs> the punchline on it. And then say, and then Max, it happened that way, and there she was. And 
the microphone's open, and there he is. <laughs> That's why I open so many times, just roaring yeah. laughing. And then, having done that to me, he gets on with his righteous, your eye hate voice saying, Max, a uh, joke is a yes, joke, but after all, there's that. an audience out there, and you are supposed to be a professional, yes. and I'm just confessing. <laughs> Come on now, Max. Let's uh, straighten up. Sure. The worst one, of course, was Yellowknife, was it? Uh, White Horse. White Horse, yeah. Whatever. Now, that went uh, for five minutes. I got panicky he opened there. the microphone, <laughs> and I said... This is the Max Ferguson show. Not not a very difficult thing. This is the Max Ferguson show for such and such a date. And now here's Max. <coughs> Max. <laughs> Max. And heaving across from me. <laughs> <laughs> Max, this is the such and such date. Uh, I'd like to remind you again, we're in White Horse, and we're looking forward to the Max Ferguson show. Max is fast approaching. <laughs> it's terrible. You remember Five as a minutes. kid getting a laughing Five fit in church? Oh, yeah. That's the feeling. It's a mixture of fun and humor at the beginning. I'm then panicked because I didn't think we'd ever get the show on the air. But you, you were never infected with Max's laughter at the beginning. You could always come on and... Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, I don't think we ever both broke up together. No, I don't think... Oh, <laughs> no. But in, in this last year, we had. Yes. Quite frequently. Oh, a couple, couple of mornings. Of great broadcast. Just great. Because... <clears throat> There'd be all the silence in there, except two voices going... <laughs> it's terrible, yeah, because the audience at home isn't let in on it, so it's really bad manners to do that, but you just can't help it sometimes. Yeah. Which one of you cheated on your announcer's test? I did. <clears throat> what did you do? Well, I said I had a university education, and was nice and refined, and so on. And your well, parents' name... <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. McKinney. Yeah, that's true. The worst, worst yeah. than cheating on his announcer's test, he got into his personal file. I don't know whether you know this yet, Peter. Oh, no, you're not Steph. Are you? No. no. Staff I was people, at one time. Yeah, well, yeah. we all had personal he files. <laughs> hidden away, they told me, in the catacombs underneath the head office building in Ottawa. He somehow got access to them, took all these terrible reports, because everybody turned him in and said he was an unfit for broadcast, uncontrollable, unmanageable, wouldn't take over. And he rewrote the whole thing. So I have yeah, found out to be one of the most cooperative. Just right. All these lies to this day are sitting the in these personal marvelous thing to be able to get one's documents and just reword everything, have it retyped, <laughs> phony signatures. <clears throat> Dear Alan was so helpful and so highly intelligent in all his presentations, and so we couldn't do without him. And the wretched letters that some of these swine had written behind oh, yeah. them, I never <laughs> yeah. forgave them. Yeah. Still Do they still list. have the fault report? <coughs> uh, no, there's no such thing. If That's you missed a station anything. call or did anything broke up on air, the next morning in your, no, in your mail slot, you, no, you get a little thing. You are charged with the following error. Error. Accepted or not accepted? You tick. Now, if you said not accepted, they left you, what was about a quarter minute at the bottom for your explanation. Yeah. You never could get it all in. Yeah. And I lived in terror because it all went in your personal file. I was a young junior announcer, and I just lived in terror to get these things mm. until I found out that what Alan did with his, he had a pencil, and was a pen, got it for Christmas, and it wrote in five different colored ink, colors of ink, and he would write across it, reason for not accepting poop, 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 poop in poop, five poop. different colors, and this girl they told me it was her full-time job to get those off management's desk before they came in in the morning. <laughs> so you did do that. I was going to ask you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 That was a ploy. And worse, man. And worse. And worse. Did Max ever right. convince you not to go to Maine? I remember there was a big argument when, when you were going down to Cape Breton for summer, and Alan would be going to Maine, and you would... It's the beginning, I think it was the beginning of this year. Yeah, uh, yeah. You were having right. an argument, trying to convince <laughs> Alan to, to stay in his own country and not go to... Well, down through the years, Maine. yes. This is no, he's still out. a traitor. Oh, yeah. Still a traitor. No, I still go to Maine. I, I like going to Maine, because I, I like to disappear for a while, and it's an easier way to do it. I get out of the country and so on. Yeah. I love Canada. Gosh, I like yeah, it's, it's the only country left, but I I like to get out of it occasionally, if nothing else, just to come back and enjoy it, even going to Europe and so on. I just feel in the last week before I'm heading home how much I want to get back to Canada. You but I'm going this year again to Maine. Whereabouts in Maine do you go? Kennebunk. Oh, really? That's where our family used to... Sp Kennebunk Beach we used to go to. Yeah. All the time. Where do you stay? The Seaside Hotel? No, I stay in a cabin. <laughs> Housekeeper <laughs> cabin. Um... <laughs> Where, where, where do you stay? <laughs> we used to stay at the Seaside Hotel in Kennebunk Beach. Oh, gee, that's nice. Well, go ahead. You can keep out of this nice. Um, <laughs> where is the Seaside? Canada. If you want to see Al this summer, you know where he is. Oh, Get down yeah. there, gang. He'd be oh. glad to see He loves gonna, human beings. Are you going to go down and visit Max in Cape Breton? Ever? Have you no, been down there? Tell, I've been, <laughs> certainly, I'd love to see him down there. Yeah, I've been there before. Yeah. Yeah, I've made like my it? visit. Do you like it down there? Oh, it's marvelous country, yes. It really is just wonderful. Six o'clock in the morning, he was up every good. morning. I'd hear him in my little bathroom, lies, brushing lies, his lies. teeth in 151 overproof, oh. my rum, 151 oh. overproof. And I hear this toothbrush going in the rum instead of water, and then... That's libel. Down with the rum. That's libel. Six That's not true. You're going to be sued. Before this is over, you're going to be sued. You've got two days to go, and I'm going to file suit <laughs> as soon as you get there in your cabin and build a stone wall yet. Ha <laughs> ha! 
<laughs> raise wasps. <laughs> bees, I'm a bee. Oh, bees, yeah. <laughs> do you think Wolf he'll do it? Do you think he'll get the wall finished, that one? You seriously? Yeah. You bet he does. He knows me. Um, knows. Yeah, I think so. Hmm. Yeah, I think if he puts his mind to something, he'll do it. You, you just returned from, what was it, West Germany you went to? To visit for, <laughs> for a Do you while. Break us both up again. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. Yeah, he even put his mind to returning from there, and we returned very quickly. <laughs> you didn't have a good time, and it oh, was. Yeah. It's difficult to explain. We went over to do it the same as we did in Ireland, yeah, around the yeah. countryside, getting items, and I guess they thought that we were going to do an in-depth documentary on the base there, which we really didn't want to do. So, well, it's not difficult to explain. You just have to be euphemistic. That's all. That's what you're doing. <laughs> No, it's a marvelous experience with the Black Forest, and so on. He loves it when I do this thing, you know, sort of covering up. It was a marvelous experience, and all the people were so kind, and we're very anxious to get back there someday. Certainly I am, because the people are so nice, and thank God we're in good hands, because we know we're well protected by the Army, and they're standing by in case of uh, chemical warfare, or indeed nuclear attack, as could happen at any time. In the meantime, most of the buildings, in fact, all of the buildings are now fully camouflaged, and the mess was awfully nice. We enjoyed, no, it was, a, it was a good time, and Max certainly did some darn good interviews from there, and some darn good, but, oh, this is what, what a mean. week. This is what I mean. What a week. <laughs> you should hear him, and then he gets on and does this. The worst thing he has ever done, and I won't say it, but was done over there, just an outrageous oh, thing no, that could never it. be told, no, I don't until you've gone to the big studio in the sky, and then okay. I'll whisper to <laughs> You can't use the word, though. <laughs> that's true. No, that's true. Can you tell tell me about Ma uh, Alan's car? That's another thing that I've heard a lot. Oh, about yes. Well, we got rid of that famous old one. He was actually doing one of the big accounts, automotive accounts, commercials, and mm -hmm. they used to plead with him, "Would you please get rid of this car?" Because it had what looked like mummy. Do you remember the mummy with Boris Karloff? And he always walked with his long strings of linen hanging out from behind him, just out of the <laughs> crypt. It was the weather stripping from inside the car, and there were 20 feet of it. The floorboards were all gone, and the car... The floorboards were gone. Water. It, was, it was water in it, and yeah, for some reason, the, the, the rocker panels at the side were just filled with water. <coughs> yeah. And wintertime, in cold weather, it was fine, because the floor was there, because it was frozen solid, the carpeting and so on. Yeah. But uh, come spring, there was a real spring breakup, and poor old Max would get in, and his feet would dangle. Oh, just, just and terrible. then he used to treat it as a human being, the famous story, which I saw happen. He drove it down in low gear. He, he had trouble starting it, and to punish it. Now, this is a CBC announcer, a supposedly mature man. When it finally made it here to the back parking lot, he got out and kicked all the fenders. He had driven it in low gear all the way down. That thing was kicked every morning for about two weeks as do punishment. Do you, you believe much of For not starting. I don't know. I've heard so many stories, yeah. Alan. That was the car he used to try and kill a CBC producer. A oh, God. Backed it up every day, and he told me if it takes a tank of gas a day, oh, Max, it's worth dear. it because sooner or later... And it was this studio. Oh, no. Studio H. <laughs> because sooner or later, he said, that guy's going to be in this. And the, lots of people smelt the exhaust coming through the air intake from the car, parked right outside against the air intake, and monoxide pouring into this very studio. I wonder where to get him, though. Yeah. Don't you have any stories about Max? No, he's always played it safe and cozy, ne never been t at all controversial of anything he said in the air. Or clean <laughs> and thought and deep, that's what I've always said. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, he got into hot water with the uh, Parliament, as he told you about that. You, you know that I've story, been. yeah. No, who, who could be more controversial than Max, really? And I, I sort of think uh, that the CBC that I'm so fond of, and I am, but I think the CBC is a little afraid of Max. I really do. <clears throat> Why? Oh, I don't know. For, you might say something derogatory about the CBC. Where would they get that impression? I don't know. Don't Unless you rat it on me to them. Oh, no. I would never He's always that. had his ear to management. See, no. Management has not spoken to me for at least 12 years. But Alan would always come up. They were wondering, Max, if you would so and so. Who's they? Well, they. Yeah, filtered through. Max, they were wondering, would you do so and so and so and so? And so. so he has his ear Some to management. Some people are afraid. Some people are afraid of Max. I don't know <clears> why. I think he must open letters and candle mail. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah. That's, that's no, the only thing you did do, you used to steal all the free passes. The top brass had free well, passes. Well, it's not you came it. along with I, me. I know I did. Yeah, I was okay. lured into it. Yeah. We'd lured steal even more than we needed lured, ourselves. Lured into it. I was. <coughs> yeah, vehicle passes. Admit two in a vehicle. But we'd always get the, the pass of the top man, the one we disliked mm. most. Well, one who was a particular bully, as a matter of fact, and just a, just a swine in every sense of the word. And then so-and-so got mad, <coughs> and so-and-so would never get mad unless it was behind your back. So we certainly took his pass. Mm. Uh, let's just, I want to pretend just, just for a moment. Say Max was missing, and you had to talk to the police and describe Max to the police where they might find him, what kind of a man he was. What would you say? What kind of a man he was? Yeah. You mean physically? Physically and otherwise. Well, I don't know. I think he's six feet tall and 
Weighs 170? <clears throat> Not now. 180? 155. Oh, oh come on. Okay. Six feet, 155. <laughs> Someone was described as it was having tired green eyes, which is a story. <laughs> tired green eyes. Oh, yes. <clears throat> oh, yes. Anyways, we'll skip that. Mas and I suppose a handsome and a strange sort of fashion. Sort of I don't sort of know. Word. How can I describe a man? Let me count the ways. I don't know. <laughs> Max, would you be able to describe Alan? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They'd say? never find him from my description, but I could certainly... Because I always talk to the cops, and whatever, even if I had anything to say, you keep talking, keep talking all the time. Keep them from writing in their books. <laughs> I would say, well, Alan was a weightlifter, of course, and he's got that characteristic, and he was a rower. He was in the shells. Yes, shell game. Shell yeah. show yeah. up today. Yep. Yeah. But he's very stockly built. Yep. Built like an anthropoid. Yep. And... Uh, well, I always used to say in these early days, not so much now, but there was a silent movie f actor. And when I first saw your picture, which must have been taken around the turn of the century, he looked just like Raymond Navarra, if people remember that name. Yeah, well, I've never agreed with that. Oh, yes, yeah, really? yeah. No, that's, that's highly comfortable. It was the loin cloth you were wearing that made me see the resemblance. Yeah. But don't ask me to describe him emotionally or spiritually, no. because that will be a Gordian knot that nobody will untangle. Can ever. You, can, you you myself. can you describe his house to me? Just leave my house out of this. Again. It's a beautiful house. Spencer, the English poet, wrote a poem called The Deserted Garden, where everything was dying and rot was setting in. That's what I always think of. The veranda's collapsing, sand is running out of the steps, all the mortars, eaves drops are coming down, but he loves it, and he just fits in there nicely. Are you going to miss doing the show with... No. <laughs> Why should I? Of course I'll miss it. 19 years. How could you possibly help but miss it? I mean, uh, Stimulate. Well, as I said, once again, the opening of my book. Uh, <laughs> my here we book. go. Yeah, the opening of my book. Yeah. Uh, oh, don't reset. That's why at 5.30 in the morning, every day for the past certain number of years, I've gotten up at 5.30 in the morning, hung up or hung over, just so I could say, and now here's Max, with ill-concealed glee uh, and a feeling of expectation, and I've never been disappointed. And it was never working. It was just great fun. He always had to do all the work. You see, skits, planning, and as I say, initiate. I mean, so for me, it's just been a, an absolute picnic. And it's a, just a great experience. And not working. No, no piece of, of cake working. for you, though, to remember every day what the date was. Oh, that was always a problem. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, <laughs> just last week, I said this is the January 15th or something like that instead of June. But that, that's pretty tricky. What he, is, what he is avoiding is, uh, is the fact that he was the catalyst. Not that he was in a peppy mood and sweetness of life, but if I came in feeling rotten, as I did so many mornings, even Every before morning. the equipment broke down, he would be in such a worse mood that I'd suddenly feel on top of the world. Because yeah. he's at his best when he's just scowling and bad-tempered and raging against the CBC and life in general. At my best, well, that's the only time, then, isn't it? Yes, yeah. yes, I've never seen him any other way. <laughs> There's nothing we can say to, to make you stay, I suppose. Oh, yeah, I suppose. No, no, no. A couple of years, maybe? No, no, no. no. I could, even if I loathe it down there, go out of my mind, I daren't come back. All the farewells, so long, Max, right if you get work, banners being hung out. I, well, get, I daren't come <clears throat> What back. makes you think you're going to be invited back, by the way? That's true. Yeah. That's true. I've buttered my bread, now I'll lie in it. That's exactly it, Roland. That's the way I like Yeah. It. Well, it's, it's, it's been a real treat for me to meet both of you people. Mm -hmm. And thank you for spending some time That's with That's very kind of you, thank you. Alan McPhee and Max May Rose. your soul never be crushed here, Peter. My fondest wish for you. Carry on. Thank you.